the divisions among many in religion today is in the area of worship. The division of worship began long ago with Cain and Abel. When God spoke to Cain concerning the offering that was not acceptable, He said in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Later, the author of the Hebrew letter would refer to those offerings made by those two brothers in Hebrews 11 and verse 4 when he said, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. The sacrifice that Cain offered unto God was unacceptable because it was not offered by faith. That division continued even unto the days of Jesus when in Matthew 15 and verse 9 He said, In vain do they worship Me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. God has authorized worship. There is a divine pattern for worship. Worship that follows this divine pattern is acceptable unto God. Worship that does not follow this divine pattern is not acceptable unto God. Again, the author of the Hebrew letter in chapter 8 and verse 5, when he looked at the offering that was made under the days of the tabernacle, referred to the statement that God had made to Moses, See that thou make it according to the pattern. This passage of Scripture refers to the worship that God had designed under the new covenant. For he refers to the example and the shadow of heavenly things. The tabernacle was an example of worship that was to come. And just as there was a divine pattern for worship during the days of the tabernacle, so there is a divine pattern for worship in our day and time. Jesus instituted this pattern in John chapter 4 and verse 24 when He stated, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Worship is not an option that, man, that God has offered unto man, but rather man must worship in spirit and in truth. This is God's pattern. And there are within the pages of the New Testament warnings against the violation of that pattern. God has never intended, nor is He pleased, with violations of His will. He has always given warnings against the violation of His divine pattern. In Mark 7 and verse 7, Jesus said, In vain do they worship Me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Man is not allowed to devise worship that he offers unto God and expect that worship to be pleasing and acceptable. God says where the commandments of men are followed in worship, that worship becomes vain, empty, useless. In 2 John at verse 9, the Scripture says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. 
The word transgress means to go beyond, to step aside. Whosoever goes beyond the doctrine of Christ has not God. In order for one to be in union with the Father and with the Son, he must abide within the doctrine, within the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus has sealed and ratified His covenant through His death upon the cross. It is a covenant just as the Old Testament was a covenant ratified by blood. The New Covenant is sealed and ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We must abide within that covenant in order to abide in the Father and in the Son. In Matthew 15 and verse 6, Jesus told the Pharisees, You do set aside the commandment of God and make it of no effect by your tradition. The, the teaching of God had become of no effect to the Pharisees because they followed tradition rather than the doctrine that God had delivered unto them. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, there is a warning that we are not to go beyond the things which are written. Therefore, in the worship of God, we must follow that which is written, that which God has authorized, so that our worship unto Him might be found acceptable in His sight. In order for our worship to be acceptable, it must be in spirit and in truth. It must be authorized by Almighty God. We must therefore seek to know what God wants us to do in our worship that we offer unto Him. There are activities that God has designed in His pattern of worship. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, at the beginning of the church age, following the baptism of those 3,000 souls, the scripture says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. These who had obeyed the gospel of Christ and had been added to the church continued steadfastly in the doctrine. They followed the doctrine. And because of that doctrine, they continued in fellowship, in the worship of God, in the breaking of bread, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, and in prayers. In this passage of Scripture, we see that there are two acts of divine worship. When we come together in the fellowship, in the worship of God, we are to break the bread, the communion of Jesus Christ that commemorates His death upon the cross for our sins, and we are to offer prayers unto Him. In Acts the 20th chapter and the 7th verse, as the spread of the gospel continued and as the church was established in various areas, we find that the disciples met upon the first day of the week and they engaged in the breaking of bread and in the preaching of the gospel. Paul preached unto them as he came to them upon this occasion. The breaking of bread, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, and preaching upon the time specified, the first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says that upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Here again we find the day that is specified for our worship unto God, the first day of the week. And also we are to give, we are to lay by in store. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes to the saints at Colossae and said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord.
Here, in this passage of Scripture, we find that we are to sing praise unto God. Hence, as we examine these passages of Scripture, we see the acts are the activities in which we are to engage upon the first day of the week as we come together for the worship of God. We are to partake of the Lord's Supper, commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are to engage in preaching or in the study of the Word of God. We are to offer prayers unto God. We are to give as we have been prospered. And we are to engage in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. These five acts upon the first day of the week as we come together in fellowship make acceptable worship unto God, for it is according to the divine pattern. But over time, various violations have occurred in the worship of Almighty God. I wish to mention three. These violations of the worship of God are not only found in the denominational world, but they have also over, over time began to occur in the church of Jesus Christ, which He has established with His blood. These are violations of God's prescribed pattern of divine worship. The first of these that we would mention is the non weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. In Mark chapter 14 at verses 22 through 25, Jesus is assembled with His disciples at the Passover feast. This event is taking place just prior to the betrayal and the judgment and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. As he eats this Passover feast with his disciples, he speaks to them and says, as he takes bread and blesses this bread, he breaks the bread, he gave it to them and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus here establishes the institution of the Lord's Supper. He tells His disciples that they are to break the bread and they are to drink the cup. The bread, he says, is my body, which is broken for you. The cup is my blood, which is shed for you unto the remission of sins. Jesus says that the time when this supper will be observed, when it will begin, is in the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 2, the church came into existence. The kingdom of God was established. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, following the preaching of the gospel and the obedience to the commands of the gospel, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. These disciples, as they became members of the New Testament church, the kingdom being established, partook of the Lord's Supper. They remembered the death of Jesus Christ, the body that was broken upon the cross and the blood that was shed upon that cross. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, they partook of that upon the first day of the week. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, they broke bread. Each first day of the week, the church is to assemble. And when the church assembles upon the first day of the week, they are to engage in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. This is the example that we have as the church observed and performed this act of divine worship. But over time, religious denominationalism has changed the observance of the Lord's Supper. And that change has even spread into the church of our Lord. 
Many do not partake of the Lord's Supper each first day of the week. And yet, this is what the Bible commands us to do. We have this example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 20 and reading through verse 28, the Scripture says, When ye come together, therefore into one place. The church comes together in one place upon the first day of the week. Paul establishes that in chapter 16 and verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, the church in Troas met upon the first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7. When you come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. The Corinthian church had polluted the partaking of the Lord's Supper. They had made it also with a common meal. Paul is condemning them for this act and explaining to them how the Lord's Supper is to be observed. He says in verse 21, For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you. This is not Paul's judgment. This is what the Lord has spoken to him through the Spirit. This is God's authorized design for the observance of the Lord's Supper. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so when the church comes together in one place upon the first day of the week, they are to partake of the Lord's Supper. There is to be a weekly observance of the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. And in the partaking of that supper, we are to examine ourselves. We are to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for our transgressions and our sins. The second violation that I would mention in the worship of Almighty God is women ministers. In many areas of religion today, women have taken over the role of preaching the gospel in the public assembly. This is not authorized by the Lord God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where the Apostle Paul discusses the preaching of the gospel among other items, in verse 34, he says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. The apostle tells the women to keep silent in the churches. As we look at this chapter of Scripture, we see that time that the church had come together and so women were to keep silence at that time, meaning they were not to engage in public speaking, in public teaching, public preaching. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 14, he says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. 
And then in the latter part of verse 5, he says that the church may receive edifying. This was a time when the church had assembled. The preaching, the prophesying, was to be for the edifying, the uplifting, the encouraging of the church. At verse 12, he says that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. The church has assembled. The church has come together. At that time was when women were to keep silence in the churches. At verse 19, Paul says, Yet in the church. The topic which Paul is discussing in this chapter of Scripture is the assembly of the church. It is the time when the saints have assembled in the church, the church had assembled, for the worship of God. In verse 23, he said, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. And then in verse 26, he says, When ye come together... And then in the latter part of that verse, he says, Let all things be done unto edifying. The 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians emphasizes the coming together of the church, the assembly of the church upon the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. They have come together for the purpose of worship. Paul discusses that act of prophesying or preaching in 1 Corinthians 14. The purpose of that preaching is to edify the congregation, to comfort the congregation, to uplift the congregation. And at that time, Paul says women are to keep silence in the churches. There is a prohibition against women speaking in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 at verses 11 through 14, he says, "Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence." Paul explains the reason why God has authorized this to be so. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Here the apostle establishes the reason why women are not to preach the gospel in the public assembly of the church. It is because Adam was first formed and also because the woman was deceived by the serpent as we recall from Genesis chapter 3. The third violation that has occurred in the worship of Almighty God is the introduction of instrumental music into the worship of God. In Romans 15 and verse 9, the Bible teaches us that we are to sing. The scripture in that particular place says, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, the apostle said, I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, Paul says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. These passages of Scripture teach us that we are to sing. We do not use instruments of music in our worship of God because they are not authorized in the New Testament. There is absolutely no mention of them in the New Testament. We know from a historical standpoint that instrumental music was not used until some five to six hundred years after the establishment of the church. This is the time at which they were first introduced into the worship of God. The New Testament specifically teaches us that we are to sing in our worship of God. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thy name. In James 5 and verse 13, Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. All of these passages of Scripture use the word sing. This is the type of music that God has authorized in New Testament worship. He has never authorized the use of instruments in our worship unto Almighty God. There is no mention of them. There is no example of them in the New Testament. So when we introduced introduce instruments into the worship of God to aid us in our singing unto God, we make that worship unacceptable before God. God does not allow us to go aside from the divine pattern of worship. We have a pattern for worship. It is the New Testament. What God states in the New Testament, we are to follow. This is why we in the Church of Christ follow this divine pattern of worship. We observe the Lord's Supper each first day of the week because this is the pattern that we have in the New Testament. Women do not engage in the preaching of the gospel in our public assemblies because this is the example that we have in the New Testament. This is the teaching of the pattern. This makes worship in spirit and in truth. We do not use instruments of music in our worship of God because the New Testament does not authorize them. Our worship must be in spirit and in truth. Cain, in the very beginning of time, offered a worship unto God, an offering unto God, that God found unacceptable. Cain was condemned for that act. And so we can draw the conclusion that God would condemn any act of worship today that is not authorized by Him. Let us follow the New Testament. Let us do only what God has authorized us to do so that we might be found acceptable unto Him in the worship that we offer unto Him. As we close our service, we offer the invitation of Jesus Christ. The invitation that is offered to many today has been changed as so many things have been changed. The Bible teaches us that we must believe the gospel of Christ we must repent of sins. We must confess the deity of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God. And we must be immersed in water for the remission of our sins. This is the invitation that we offer as we stand and sing this hymn.